Hello, this is Andy from HowEFIWorks.com, and today I want to do a presentation on the goals of any EFI install or tune. This is the things you want to think about when you go through the process of picking, purchasing, installing, and tuning of any EFI device. This doesn't really matter if it's some sort of motorcycle, drag car, road race car, it's all pretty much the same thing. There are three basic types of EFI tuning systems. The first is what I call a reflash system. This is very common with the HP tuners, Harley Davidson, most anything that uses the ODB port to reprogram the software that's in your vehicle. Typically, this requires no rewiring of the car, no changing of sensors, anything like that. The next one I want to call plug and play. Basically, it's a pre-engineered system. Typically, we'll use either their supplied sensors that come with the system or your sensors in your vehicle, but the system has been designed around those sensors. There are quite a few systems out on the market today that do this, and almost every day there seems to be more of them. The last is the standalone system. Basically, you wire it from scratch. These things have huge varieties of the amount of talent they expect the installer to have. It goes from anything from, for the most part, we know what the sensors are, to you engineer it from the beginning and then use their software to tune it. One of the big things you need to keep in mind is does the system have some sort of auto-tune and data logging capability? Auto-tune can be anything from it runs live on the vehicle, adjusting the VE tables, timing tables, that sort of thing. Um, it could be using a mass airflow and claiming it's some sort of auto-tune or data logging, which you later put into some sort of software program to analyze the data to trim the VE tables or timing tables as required offline to put back in the system to retest. The first thing you want to do when doing a system from scratch, the option number three on the screen before, is you have to have a well-documented plan for how you're going to wire the car. On the right is just a typical wiring diagram showing system wire colors, that sort of thing. That's nothing in particular other than just have a plan of attack. You must follow the standard wiring practices from the manufacturer. They've put these together with a combination of engineering and learning from the school of hard knocks of what has gone wrong with customer installs. Standard practices are very valuable. Follow them as close as possible. One of the things I see people make a mistake is they try to save as much of the original wiring as they can. This can be a real problem. Also, the wiring must be designed from the beginning, laid out and color coded because you have to assume you're going to have to troubleshoot it at a later date. So now let's go through some of the goals that I want to try to achieve as I go through an install. The first one is fast startup and clean running through the entire RPM range. This includes no lost sync errors or RPM dropouts. RPM dropouts or lost sync errors are basically the ECU is lost where the crankshaft is in its 720 degrees of rotation and normally shows up in a data log as a drop in RPM to zero or possibly a spike to very high RPM that then returns. The next thing I'd like to set as a goal is stable idle from startup to full warm up regardless of idle loads. What I mean by idle loads is turning on headlights, wipers, that sort of thing, anything that changes the load on the alternator, or possibly an air conditioner. Stable idle from startup to warm up is a little less important on a pure race car where you may not mind playing with the throttle 
or just using an idle screw to bring up the idle to get it to warm up. But it's very aggravating if, if it's a car you're going to live with on a daily basis. The next thing I want to talk about is will you be able to get the fueling delivery that hits your target AFRs through the entire operating range of the motor? Dyno operators want to talk about the full throttle horsepower and AFRs that your motor is delivering and often even want to exclude AFR in the conversation. In reality, the motor goes through a huge dynamic range. In the first type system we were talking about, where you're retuning the factory install, we often have long and short term fuel trims. The goal here is to minimize the short term trims. Our goal is to have zero everywhere. It will never happen. More of a plus or minus a few percent is fantastic. Next, I want to talk about sizing your fuel injectors. When you start running a motor and start bringing it up on full power, one of the first things I look at is injector duty cycle. Generally, you want to aim for about 75 to 85% duty cycle at full power. A little side note, this assumes that your max RPM is around 6,000 RPM. What you'll find is high revving motors have less spray time available. 720 degrees rotation of the crankshaft happens really quick and you have to be able to close the injectors, let them rest and reopen again. So you'll find on a motorcycle, that sort of thing, you can easily get to a max duty cycle of 65 to 75% before you start hitting issues. I like to aim for about two milliseconds minimum pulse width. This is at idle or on a downshift whenever possible. You got to keep in mind that about one millisecond is dead time where the injector is really not spraying fuel. If you're having trouble staying within the range of the first two bullet points, staged injection where you have one set of injectors for running the bottom end and then bringing on or switching to larger injectors as you start bringing on the power may be a good option. Last at the bottom, you'll see that 100% equals 102% equals 130% duty cycle. There is no such thing as over 100% duty cycle. I see it all over the internet. My car runs great and it's got 130, 140% duty cycle. No, it doesn't. What's happened is the ECU has lost control of the fueling. And at this point, the only thing that's controlling the fueling is the size of the injector the pressure in the fuel rail, and possibly the supply of fuel from the fuel pump. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the fuel system itself, everything before the fuel injectors. A fuel injector needs about 42 to 60 PSI across the injector to effectively work. All injectors are rated in this range. So if you look on the internet, that's where they're talking about. Sometimes they don't mention it, but it's 42 to 60 PSI supplied to the injector. A turbo motor pulling 50 PSI of boost requires a fuel pump that can produce 100 PSI and must deliver huge vol volumes of fuel at the same time. If you start looking through the internet and trying to figure out what it takes to produce those sort of pressures and volumes, it's gonna be expensive. Keep that in mind that your typical Walbro in-tank fuel pump will not keep up on these big turbocharged or even medium-sized turbocharged motors. You want to make sure that the tune continues to hit your target AFRs regardless of weather and altitude. Again, another thing that the dyno guys do not want to talk about. But if you're going to be racing at sea level one weekend or close to sea level one weekend and the next weekend you're at three or four thousand foot altitude like in anywhere near denver this can be huge or how often do you tune a car in the dead of summer when it's 100 degrees on the parking lot or track and your championships you have to start up on a 40 degree evening and try to run at that weather does the system you have have the ability to get your tune back fuel mileage what is acceptable for the intended use of the motor in the case of a race car 
mileage may or may not be a big deal. If you have an endurance car, it can be a very big deal running out of fuel on the last lap. In a drag car, it almost doesn't matter. But it's one of those things to consider, how are you going to figure that out? I also want to have clean throttle response, no matter what you do with throttle. A car that feels good on the dyno, but will not transition, is a nightmare to live with. You've probably started the tuning process with a relatively safe known timing map, but eventually you need to get on a dyno to maximize torque without ever getting into detonation, and that's through the entire range of the motor. A dyno is a huge help here, but it can get brutally expensive because this is very time consuming. Accurate and stable boost control. This is a motor that's gone to full throttle, the green at the top. You can see the manifold air pressure in white coming up, and then it varies a little bit. What that is, is the boost control setting in. What we're concentrating on is having the ability to control the boost control in your motor. Without data logging, this is almost impossible to tell what's going on. The next goal I'd like to talk about is OEM-like drivability. What is that? Well, every time you get into a brand new car, a Honda, a brand new Chevrolet, even up into the brand new superpower cars, these things are drivable. It's really hard to believe that you might have four, five, six hundred horsepower, and it's no real problem to drive. That's our goal of setting up an EFI system. You want smooth power delivery, predictable throttle response, and I want to add that turbo installs make this very difficult. The problem with a turbo is once it starts making power, it wants to continue making power, and I often see that you have to get all the way back to maybe 5 or 10% throttle position to just get the thing to stop making boost. That makes it very difficult to drive if you do get in trouble. Also, you want to maximize power at wide open throttle given the combination of parts you currently have in the motor. This is when you really need to be on a dyno. A dyno has the ability to chase down where you might have a 2 or 3% increase in torque at exactly this point in the power curve. This can be done with data logging, but it's very difficult. Next, you want to experiment with different combinations of parts to increase power. Whether that's being dialing in your camshaft, uh, possibly changing header links, collector links, all that sort of thing. Keep in mind that anytime you're making these changes, you need to verify almost everything on all the previous screenshots. Again, that gets very time consuming, but a huge cam may break your clean starts. Having access to a dyno is a huge advantage in this part of the tuning process. Now I wanna talk about setting up all the features that are unique to your sport or install. For example, flat shift on a motorcycle, launch control trans brakes if you're drag racing, Turbo anti-lag, turbo boost timers, again, mostly for racing. The drift guys want to keep those turbos spooled up, and that's no small task. And it takes time to set all that up, and you have to have the ability to set that up. If you have a system that's designed as a reflash system, often you simply cannot get there from here. A standalone is your only real option. CAN network, the ability to talk to the dash, transmission controllers, that sort of thing. How are you going to deal with wheel speed sensors, GPS speed, traction control? You need sensors on all four wheels. you got to make sure you have a way to do that if you need traction control. Transmission control and other I.O. I.O., by the way, in the EFI world is input-output. It's your ability to send signals to other devices or collect typically zero to five volt inputs coming back into your ECU to control other things. Something you may not normally think about on the plug and play systems often is alternator control. 
But if you're coming up from scratch, how are you going to keep a stable voltage to the system? VVT control, VVT mapping, that's variable valve timing. Almost any car that's made in the last five years or so, they seem to be moving the cam timing based on the load on the motor. If you have one of those motors, you better have a ability to tune it. Detonation detection, knock control, and traction control, wheelie control. These are all things that, depending on the system you choose, you, you may or may not be able to get to where your goals are. Having data logging capability to be able to verify all the above for the life of the vehicle. Remember that the person that tuned your motor may not be available in the future. And if you have a Honda pulling 500 horsepower, your Honda dealer simply will not touch the car. So you are on your own. It's just something to remember if you get into this world. Always keep in mind that nobody cares about your car as much as you do. And that includes the dyno operator at three, four, five hundred dollars an hour. He simply does not have the time to continue to look at data like you do. I would like to thank my friends at TunerStudio.com. These guys are the developers of Megalogular HD, the software I personally use to look at almost any data log off of any engine data. It's the software I use to develop all these screenshots. Thank you for watching. And please remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel.